thank you to all of you for joining. Obviously, this is a very fast and unprecedented environment in which you're, we're in. There is a lot of uncertainty. Um, there's uncertainty over what the short-term future looks like, both in terms of managing the spread of the virus, the lockdown, exit strategies, and the economic impact of it. And also over the longer term, how the impact of COVID-19 will manifest itself and what that will mean for businesses and economies. As Mark mentioned, um, we at CT are known for our election campaigns and also our research and polling, which underpins election campaign strategies. But actually that's less than 10% of our work. The vast majority of our work is working with corporates to understand their clients, to understand their customers and their key audiences and understand what's driving their behavior. Um, we'll look to understand not just what people think, but why they think it. And therefore, during this, we wanted to understand not what people are thinking about the virus, but what's driving the public's perception and their behavior. And critically, what is their likely future behavior going to be and how this will impact on businesses and leaders. Um, now, no opinion research can predict the future. But because we're conducting the track of polling in five markets, which are at different stages in the pandemic, we can identify market trends and start to anticipate likely future behavior. So as Mark said, we've been conducting uh, research for the last five weeks on a weekly basis and we'll continue to do so in the UK, the US, India, Hong Kong and Australia. And this afternoon, I'm gonna focus on two elements. Firstly, the public's view of the impact of the virus and how this is driving their behavior, their perceptions and their spending patterns. And then secondly, how the impacts the longer term business environment in which uh, business leaders are making decisions. So I'm just going to share my screen um, and start showing you some of the data that we are starting to see. So first of all, just from a methodological point of view, each survey is 500 respondents in each market, giving a margin of error of plus or minus 4.5%, but at a 95% confidence interval. And as you can see from the dates of when we're in field, this is in the last couple of days that we've just come out of the field with this latest track. This is track five of uh, so far that we have conducted. Just a bit of context to start off with, and I hope you guys can see my cursor because I'll be using it as a laser pointer during the presentation. Firstly, just to recognize the state of where we are with regards to the pandemic. And as you'll see in terms of total deaths per 1 million of the population, there is a significant difference between the UK and the US and the other markets. Now, while that is important to understand where we are from a kind of statistical point of view from uh, death rates and uh, infection rates, that's not necessarily the only guide in terms of what's driving people's behavior. Just as we go through this, if you see, you'll see a number of uh, graphs. The blue lines are gonna be the USA, the red lines are the UK, and so on in terms of Australia and Hong Kong. I'll also be showing you slides that show the latest snapshot from track five, but the more uh, insightful ones are seeing how that has tracked over time. So you can start to see some of the market trends that we're seeing as well. So first off, how are people actually perceiving us to be and where are they perceiving us to be in the pandemic life cycle? So we ask people, do they think we're at the early stages at the peak or at the latter stages of the pandemic? The key things to focus on here are when you're looking at the UK, the vast majority of the people believe that we're reaching peak and have reached peak in terms of infection rates and mortality rates. Compare that with Hong Kong, where the vast majority of people think we're going through peak and to the latter stages of the virus. Now, why that's so important, just to uh, point out early on, is that my point about you can't predict the future, but you can certainly see in markets which are more advanced in the life cycle, how behavior patterns have changed, and therefore where the likely changes are going to happen in the UK or more uh, other markets in the West. So how has this changed over time? Well, it's changed very rapidly. So just four weeks ago on our first track, 86% of people in the UK thought we were at the early stages. We are now just four weeks in, 75% of people in the UK 
believing that we're at peak. The same is true to a certain extent in terms of the US with two in three people believing they're at peak. But if you compare that with Australia and Hong Kong, certainly Hong Kong, the same number of people believe they're at peak that also believe they're at the latter stages. And as some of the measures that have been recently introduced by the Hong Kong leadership in terms of releasing lockdown, that has reinforced that view. But one of the key takeaways from this is just how quickly the public's perception has shifted in terms of where we are in the pandemic. So where do they think in terms of the expected timelines on social distancing? Again, it's the trend that's the most interesting one. If you look at Hong Kong, nowadays they are looking, the vast majority of people think that social distancing timeframe will last somewhere between the next one and four months. But contrast that sharply with the UK, not only do we think the, line, the, long, the timeline will be longer, possibly even up to six to 12 months, and the same we see in Australia as well, but there's actually quite a lot of uncertainty. It's a fairly flat curve, and therefore a lot of unknowns in terms of how long this lockdown will continue. And we see that consistently across America, the UK, uh, less so in Australia. Australia's got a bit more of a peak, but also a very long time away. So where do they think the lifetime will be in terms of returning to normal work? And again, we're seeing a couple of trends. Firstly, that in Hong Kong, they think normal life will return fairly quickly. That's in around two to four months. Now, whatever normal life may mean, they still think it'll be returning in the next two to four months. Whereas in the UK, in America, and in Australia, fairly flat curves, so a lot of uncertainty as to how long before we come out of this crisis and some form of normality does return anywhere in the UK from between four to six months up possibly to two years. And that clearly has an impact in terms of people's behavior, especially as we see going forward with regards to personal finances and concerns over the economy. What we have seen advising clients in Hong Kong and across different markets is the types of questions were being asked from clients in Hong Kong about two and a half months ago are now the same types of questions were being asked by clients in the UK and in the US in the Western markets. And what we certainly see is during the life cycle of the pandemic, immediate concerns on health very quickly shift towards longer term concerns with regards to the economy. And there is certainly a sense that this isn't gonna be a quick recovery, that actually the long tail of this in terms of the economic impact is gonna last a lot longer. Just as a slight aside, because this is certainly interesting and I'm sure will resonate with you, uh, we ask how long people think they can last in isolation or in lockdown before it seriously impacts their physical or mental health. At the moment, they're saying somewhere between two to four weeks. Now, the interesting thing about this is that two to four weeks timescale has not shifted since the start of the tracker, i.e. every time you ask that question, people think they can do another two to four weeks in lockdown before it affects their physical or mental health in a serious way. Therefore, they're probably more adapted and resilient than they necessarily give themselves credit for. So in terms of the perceptions of the virus, a couple of things to point out here. Firstly, that people certainly don't think it will disappear as quickly as it came. In fact, people increasingly not agreeing with that statement the more we progress into the virus. But more importantly on this is this overwhelming sense and increasingly overwhelming sense that life will not be the same after coronavirus. How that manifests itself, what it means for our personal lives, what it means for business, what it means for how we operate still is a big unknown. And we're in a kind of no man's land on that. But certainly there is a strong feeling that life will not be the same after coronavirus. And that leads to uh, optimism, but it also leads to uncertainty and anxiety. And as I come to later, certainly the public will be looking towards their leaders to give clarity and some kind of certainty as to what that means. So how are they expecting it to affect their lives? Right at the start of this tracker, as I mentioned, physical health was where they perceived to be the most negative impact expected because of the virus. Now that has started to shift, so the darker the color, 
the more recent the track is. So the minus 12% in terms of um, how negatively impacted their physical health will be has started to come back to slightly more normal levels with the immediate kind of concerns over health starting to recede. However, the two concerns in, that I've highlighted, firstly in terms of personal finances and future financial security, and then very immediate concerns in terms of how it affects their social plans and personal freedom. And what we see in this is that over the last five weeks, the impact that people thought it would have on their social plans and their personal freedom has actually dissipated quite quickly. People see a kind of light at the end of the tunnel that quite quickly their social plans will start to be back to uh, normal and their personal freedoms won't be as hindered as much. However, in terms of personal finances and their future financial security, the concerns on that and the negative impact they expect from the virus on that has remained very sticky. Um, that is even more highlighted when we look at fear of redundancy. And while there has been a week on week shift and slight dissipation with regards to the number of people who are concerned about being made redundant, you still have a significant number of people, 31% of respondents in the UK, fearing that they're going to be made redundant. Um, still very high figures in terms of Hong Kong as they start to face the challenges of the economic impact and the top concerns going from health and moving across to the economy. People's behavior is very much driven by their values and therefore we always want to understand which values have been impacted by current events. The way to read this slide is that the closer a dot is to this orange dot, the more it has been negatively impacted and the closer it is to this orange dot, the more it has been positively impacted. The first thing to notice from this slide is there are a lot more deep values negatively and significantly negatively impacted by the virus than have been positively impacted. The key ones to look at, because it's driving a lot of behavior, is the negative impact it's had on feeling safe and secure. That's driving the anxiety and that's driving the uncertainty along with the having a peace of, uh, peace of mind. Any businesses communicating that can tap into and start to try and mitigate or neutralize the negative impact on that safety and security will certainly have an open ear and be more effective. The other one on the positive impact that's worth bearing in mind is the sense of pride in the country and how it's responding to it. There is certainly anecdotal evidence that public in each market do not view this as a global fight against a kind of global enemy, but more their country's fight against the common, that common enemy being the virus. And they certainly feel that governments and business leaders should be responding to their needs in their locality, recognizing that other countries' leaders and other countries' businesses will be doing the same thing in their environments. And one trend that we are seeing that might start emerging is what we would call economic sovereignty and that uh, desire for countries to be more self-sufficient or recognition of that self-sufficiency and not necessarily relying on just a few other markets in terms of their economic prosperity and making sure the national infrastructure works and I'll return to that slightly later but it's worth bearing in mind throughout this presentation that negative impact it's had on feeling safe and secure as also the sense of pride in the country. So how have consumer behaviours changed? We start with a forced question, of which is the most important to you? To stay close to your inner circle and be deeply loyal to those you know best in your local community, or to widen your horizons and meet different people and see different places. The reason we do this forced choice is because it's a big driver in terms of people's behaviour. What we see here is that 67% of respondents in the UK feel it's more important to stay close to their inner circle and be deeply loyal than it is to widen their horizons. This isn't a question in terms of whether they're able to or not, it's just the one that is most important. We regularly do polling across the world and when we'd asked this question just a year ago, 55% of respondents said it was more important to widen their horizons, meet different people and see different places, and 45% saying staying close to your inner circle. 
In fact, so significant are these figures that we haven't seen this type of um, divide since the immediate post 9-11 um, situation. And that feeling of hunkering down or protecting what you have obviously has a big impact in terms of uh, consumer spending and consumer behavior. So what changes have we seen in consumer behavior? To be honest, most of these won't surprise you at all. Um, they've fa stayed fairly consistent across the markets and across time during the lockdown. People are spending more time online, people are watching more TV, uh, people are using more video calling, getting used to Zoom and Microsoft Teams. Um, but what we are starting to see uh, is people stocking up le or less stocking up of food. So that immediate concern that we weren't going to be able to get the essentials has dissipated somewhat as supermarkets and retailers have reassured people that the stocks will be there and countries have responded to ensure that stuff that we need on a day-to-day -day basis to get by is going to be available. However, on a false choice, and this comes down to the, point for, uh, the personal finances uh, driver, am I spending roughly the same amount of money that I usually would to keep happy, healthy, and occupied during lockdown? Or am I spending less to protect my finances? And again, it's the trend on this that is most important and looking towards Hong Kong as an indication of where, um, where things will head in the future. So over the last week, where there has been talk from the leadership in Hong Kong of releasing uh, lockdown and easing some of the restrictive measures and moving, getting on top of the pandemic and therefore moving away from health concerns to economic concerns, but people are seeing a light at the end of the tunnel and therefore a significant reduction in the number of people who are spending less in order to protect their future finances. And we're seeing the same thing in Australia, where that trend also mirrors that in terms of talk of easing some of the lockdown measures and therefore feeling we're starting to come out of maybe some of the worst parts of it from a health point of view and moving on to the latter stages. So I just got stuck. So in terms of current spending habits, obviously, as you'd expect, entertainment subscription people have been spending more in terms of entertainment subscription services to try and maintain uh entertainment at home and obviously in terms of live sporting events international holidays domestic holidays live entertainment that's taken a big hit however again it's the shift that we're starting to see in hong kong that's starting as giving us some insight into where consumer behavior is going to head so in the last week with those measures announced and foretold in Hong Kong, we're starting to see a very significant and quick reduction in the amount of money spent on entertainment subscription services. And we're starting to see some of these measures like money spent in bars, clubs, nightclubs, um, people trying, starting to go back to live entertainment, live sporting events, and also starting to book domestic or international holidays. We're starting to see that reduce and those significant movements um, within just a week of the lockdown, uh, lockdown measures announced that those are going to be lifted. So where do people think they're going to be spending their money once the virus ends? And again, I'm going to start with Hong Kong because this gives an indication as to where consumer behavior will go, not over the immediate term, but over a slightly longer period. First of all, having had the lockdown of wanting to go away and get on an international holiday and live entertainment. So as we saw earlier in terms of that forced question of whether it's more important to stay close to your inner circle or whether it's broadening horizons, you saw Hong Kong line was far more evenly divided than it was in some of the Western markets of the UK and the US. And therefore they're very much looking for an international holiday and back to live entertainment. Contrast that with the UK and the same in the US and Australia, the types of things that they want to be spending their money on or think they're going to be spending their money on immediately after the virus are the types of events that you would do with close family and friends. So restaurants and cafes, the types of things that they've been immediately denied during the lockdown. Obviously in terms of uh, all those men who have been buying uh, hair clippers so they can actually get their hair cut during this uh, lockdown. 
same applies in terms of that kind of personal um, personal stuff in terms of barbers and salons. And then after that comes the domestic holiday and the international holiday. But very much the immediate focus on where we expect to see immediate consumer spends is around the kind of locality and therefore restaurants, cafes, and the things that they've been denied immediately um, during, the, during the lockdown process. Just as a slide aside, and I thought just because of a couple of people who are on, the, uh, on this webinar, people are wanting to protect their money and spend less with an economic, uh, with uncertain economic future. The interesting thing here to note is people will be recognizing that they are spending more on utilities and noting that, and therefore that presents both an opportunity but also a threat to utility companies in terms of underscoring the importance they are to national economy and infrastructure. And the second thing to look at here is while people have been spending a little bit more in terms of their mobile phone data plans and the telecoms on that side of things, what they haven't been spending on is slightly more uh, expensive outlays, i.e. a new phone or a laptop. So while they're spending more time on technology, they're not at the moment wanting to spend money on the actual hardware of technology, it's much more just with regards to spending more time on data plans or spending more money on data plans and actually the connectivity. So what does this mean in terms of the kind of longer term outlook um, with regards to business and government and decisions and the environment that are gonna to need to be made in the future uh, and the longer economic impact? I think there's one thing that it doesn't need research to point out that is just going to be a simple reality. And that is that the influence and impact of government on the post lockdown world will remain broader and deeper than probably most of us have ever witnessed. Um, a combination of government spending, of regulatory interventions, and together with a fairly fractured economy and uncertain business environment, I think probably means that the private sector does need to accept a new reality in the way that it deals with government. Probably where for more than a decade, business has sought to position itself as good corporate citizens, there will now be probably added and more urgent imperatives in terms of the very basic issues of business survival, whether that's taxes, costs, regulation, or competitiveness. And there'll be a lot of competition among businesses and industry sectors to get the attention of governments to make their case. And I think businesses will have to show that they can contribute to job creation and protection, to faster economic recovery, to greater export earnings, uh, new market expansion, enhanced economic sovereignty, and demonstrate that they're not over-reliant on one or two countries for sourcing products. And business will need to make its case to government or defend itself from calls for greater government spending and intervention. So first of all, how the public perceived governments to have performed in communicating on the pandemic? The first thing we see that despite necessarily what we see in the media on a day to day basis, respondents certainly recognize that this is an unprecedented and fast moving nature of the pandemic. And accordingly, are giving governments a credit for handling a very difficult situation. But this is also probably quite soft. So, what we're seeing at the moment, and this is a net figure, that 51% more people in the UK believe the government communication on the pandemic has been good than think it's been poor. But as I say, that is a very soft measure at the moment, as we see very large increase in the last week alone in the perception of how the Hong Kong leadership has communicated on the pandemic, moving more than uh, almost 30 percentage points in one week, which is a significant shift and probably reflects a appreciation for the lifting of uh, restrictive measures and an easing of lockdown. And therefore they've got a very immediate and quick bounce. Whether that is sustained over time, we'll only see from the future, um, future tracks. However, in terms of business as a corporate citizen, because the public are giving, uh, are recognizing the fast moving and difficult environment, and therefore giving appreciation to governments for how they're handling it and supporting society at this time, it does mean that governments are setting the bar in terms of how to respond to the crisis. So at the moment, and this has been bouncing around a little bit, but stayed fairly consistent, 
that 56% of people in the UK agree that governments are doing enough to support society at this time. However, contrast that with businesses, and this has been consistently on the slide over the last couple of weeks, that the public's perception that businesses are doing enough to support society at this time is starting to drop away. And as primary concerns shift from health across the economy, the expectation on business to play its role in the economy will only increase. So if you compare this central graph with the one on the right, the one on the right is an expectation question. The big business in general should be providing services at a discount or for free at this time of need, even if it isn't financially rewarded for them to do so. There is strong agreement with that statement, but it's an expectation question. It's what do I expect of big business? But at the moment, there is a deficit between what the public are expecting of big business and what is actually being delivered. And that is also consistent across all the markets with the exception of India. However, on the positive side, there is a increasing recognition that businesses are gonna play an increasingly important role in terms of the economic recovery, and that is gonna have some consequences. So early on in the tracker, if asked the question whether big business in general should be focused on ensuring their survival, even if it results in job losses, there were fewer, less than 50% of people, there's just 40% of people agreed with that statement. That is slowly but decisively on the rise of more people agreeing with that, recognizing that big business is gonna play an important role going forward and therefore their survival becomes increasingly important. The same is true of whether employers should keep all their staff on regardless of the financial impact. That agreement on that has been steadily declining again as they recognize that we need businesses to drive forward on the economy. So how does this manifest itself in the immediate term looking at lockdown? First thing to note on this in terms of whether people are adhering to social distancing guidelines um, and true to form, uh, the British are fairly uh, adhering to that. Three in four people are strictly following every guideline without exception. Uh, with 22% following most of them. What we are seeing is some uh, breaking of the rules in the US, and obviously we've seen recent protests over that. Whether now is the right time to end isolation and lockdown, at the moment, only 15% of people in the UK agree with that statement, and far more disagree with it. So you've got seven in 10 people saying now is not the right time to end isolation and lockdown. Contrast that with Hong Kong, which is further along in the economic, uh, in the life cycle of the pandemic, much stronger agreement that now is the time to end isolation. So in terms of forced choice, of whether it is more important for the government to lift lockdown measures as soon as possible, even if it risks more infections, or, the government should keep the lockdown in place for as long as possible, even if it risks further harm to the economy, people in the UK still remain in that uh, focus on the health concerns and ensuring that we get on top of the pandemic rather than starting to release uh, lockdown measures to drive the economy. Still remain in the um, economic, uh, still remain in the health concerns. And while that is, while that is in Hong Kong, not quite as significant. There are still moves and we're seeing it in Hong Kong as these numbers start reducing week on week as they start to see more and more days without any new infections. So which industries do the public think are a priority for the government to release lockdown on? I'm gonna start with Hong Kong which has released some sectors already, construction is going on and some of the heavy industry is already um, working again in Hong Kong. And therefore their focus is very much on the banking and finance sector, recognizing that's a key industry for Hong Kong's economy. And their second biggest one is airlines and international travel. Now airlines and international travel and why they think that should be um, lifted from lockdown is not linked to the fact that they want to take international holidays. It is a recognition that Hong Kong needs 
international business travelers and leisure travelers to come into Hong Kong to drive its economy. So it's very much focused on the need of other countries to travel, uh, travelers from other countries to come in to get their economy going again. The sharp contrast in some of the Western markets is that people perceive, people believe that the government's focus should be on more, much more heavy industry and that that should be unlocked first to keep the, and drive the economy. And that is consistent across the UK and also in the US. The fact that education is in there quite high up is probably a reflection of a couple of things. One is just the difficulty of getting on with work and driving your business forward while also homeschooling, but also a recognition that once schools go back, it does make business easier um, to operate and therefore can focus more time in terms of making sure your business is profitable and is driving growth through a fairly difficult economic time. So just a couple of key insights to finish off with before opening it up for questions. Um, firstly, obviously the majority of those in the UK and Western markets and Hong Kong believe the coronavirus has reached its peak. Um, one thing that we'll just watch is that while mortality and infection rates remain low in India, most Indians still believe that they haven't reached peak and it's in the early stages. But as infection and mortality rates do reduce, primary concerns do shift from health to financial. And this is certainly an opportunity for businesses to demonstrate and com communicate their value. While there is strong and increasing recognition the world will change, people still don't know what that will look like. And they'll certainly be looking to their leaders to demonstrate decisiveness and competence and a way forward as they yearn for some clarity over long-term implications. And as we've seen in Hong Kong, some of the immediate consumer spending will be focused on activities that they've been denied during lockdown. And we'll see further on in the tracker as it progresses, how the more medium term consumer behavior starts changing. And then just a couple of other ones, which reinforce the point with regards to business and government. There will be the influence and impact of government post lockdown will remain broad and deep. And a common, and certainly businesses will need to fight hard um, to get their voice heard either in terms of ensuring that governments are supporting them or to ensure that they are not uh, victims of calls for greater government spending increased taxes increased regulation um, certainly any business that can demonstrate its contribution to job creation and protection faster economic recovery and enhanced economic sovereignty will probably be well placed in terms of getting the kind of support that it needs uh, from government. So joining me to discuss some of those findings and to share with us their hopes, dreams, fears, concerns, uh, and their predictions are Chris Snowden, the head of lifestyle economics at the IEA, and Adam Barter, the director of the Epicenter Network of Free Market Think Tanks. Uh, good to see you both, gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining me. Hi, Mark. Great to be here. To be here. Um, Chris, I'm going to start with you. Uh, it's pretty depressing news, isn't it? Uh, I mean, free market liberals like us would have thought that people would be going stir crazy by now, demanding their freedom back. Uh, desperate to start practicing the Calvinistic work ethic all over again, yearning to get back to the office and add to GDP. But it looks like everybody just wants to stay on holiday forever. Uh, yeah, it seems like a, a, a large majority of people are happy with it. Maybe happy is not the right word. Um, I think that it's a, it's a combination of people who are genuinely actually pretty content with um, being furloughed. There are over 6 million people furloughed. So they don't have to do any work, can't do any work, um, and still are on a uh, full pay or something very close to it. And then there are people who are just terrified. And yeah, I think it's understandable. Some people believe that if we just knuckle down for another two weeks and another two weeks, and I thought it was very interesting in the presentation that this seems to be this two week tolerance people have, but then after two weeks, it's another two weeks. So people maybe, I, I guess, are, are looking for light at the end of the tunnel and believe that it will appear. But I think that's mistaken. I think if there is a large number of people who believe that this is a essentially a short haul effort 
and that if we just bed down for another two weeks and another two weeks, we will stamp it out and life will go back to normal. I'm afraid they, all the science suggests that they are, are wrong about that. So, uh, Adam, what are your thoughts? The, the fear seems to be that people think that there's just another fortnight, but if you like, tomorrow never comes, right? It's uh, wherever we are, it's just going to be another 14 days and nights to get out of it. Uh, how do we ever, uh, let alone ease the lockdown, but begin to get people on side for a return to normality, do you think? What were the standout statistics and findings for you, Adam? Well, I think people are terrified and not without reason. Uh, I think this is by far the largest public health economic crisis um, and social challenge that we, we faced in this century. Um, and there are no easy solutions for this. There we will be some trade-offs, um, both in terms of economic and public health aspects. But I think it's, it is worth to emphasize that the current pandemic um, is unlike the regular flu season and its impact is far greater on public health than anything that we have encountered. So although from a classical liberal perspective, I'm very much for finding a solution in the mid and long term to kind of mitigate the negative economic and societal impacts of, of the lockdown. I don't think that a couple of weeks, um, even more than a month of lockdown, is completely unfeasible under the current circumstances. Um, but we also know what works and what doesn't seem to work. And in terms of solutions going forward, how we can return to at least a semi-normal life, we have, we have known for a while now that masks do work, that people should be covering their face as often and as regularly as possible. We do know that testing and tracing does work. And we do know that social distancing works. Uh, what doesn't work is remaining in our homes up until the end of the year or up until there is a vaccine. We know that this is not feasible, but we kind of have to find a balance between returning to work gradually whilst keeping some, some of these social distancing measures in place. And obviously, from a libertarian perspective, that's fairly difficult. Uh, let me just press you a bit on this, uh, Adam. Again, looking at the findings, because... Uh, uh, we would probably expect as classical liberals ourselves to find ourselves in a minority in opinion polls. It nearly is always the way. Uh, perhaps we're just ahead of the curve. But do you think here people, I mean, you, both of you have mentioned it's understandable that people are concerned. Uh, but do you think people are not acting rationally? That They're putting a disproportionate weight on an immediate health risk, which I'm not trying to trivialise, but, you know, it is killing in the UK perhaps two or 300 people a day, but have cast aside almost any economic or financial consideration. It's kind of closed down the economy, you know, don't open any more shops, don't let people trade, until what? Until there is no death rate left in the United Kingdom from anything? Uh, it, it just seems to me the two are out of kilter. I agree it's a balancing act, but it is as if any risk to human health seems to completely outweigh any metrics or numbers on GDP and productivity? I don't think that this is necessarily the trade-off, to be fair. Um, you're right that people in the short term are shielded from the negative economic impact of the lockdown through the furloughing scheme in the United Kingdom. Um, so definitely they're going to place more emphasis on their health than, than on the negative economic repercussions that might be down the line in five, ten years when we need to repay the debt that the United Kingdom's government is currently borrowing. Um, but to be fair, I think it's worth to look at other examples across Europe. Um, and Sweden did not implement a lockdown. It's the most less fair country um, within Europe uh, when it comes to handling the pandemic. But if you look at the economic impact in Sweden, it's not any better than in the United Kingdom or in countries with a very strict lockdown mainly because people realize the public health um, kind of dangers that they're encountering and they're voluntarily social distancing and voluntarily shutting down the whole economy. So just because there is no legislation against economic activity, it doesn't mean that we're going to get economic activity going. Is, is that right? The, the, the economic damage is exactly the same in Sweden? It seems hard to believe when they have got so many more businesses open, they're not furloughing 
20% of the workforce, as far as I know, it's, it's, it seems unlikely that they would be suffering quite as much. With, um, there was a very interesting research from Capital Economics coming out two, two days ago, three days ago, um, that looked at um, the manufacturing output and the real GDP um, in Sweden and some of the neighboring countries with much stricter uh, lockdown measures. And, and they're incredibly similar. Um, I, wonder, right, I, wonder, I wonder on that, Adam, is that, I mean, we can always say there's lies, damn lies and statistics and to ignore the reports that don't fit our prejudices. But might the Swedes find that they're doing less structural damage to their economy, if you see what I mean, that their businesses might only be going at half tilt. But because they're going at half tilt, we could speculate that they will have many fewer business liquidations in six months time. Whereas we might find in the UK, having put the private side of the economy into the deep freeze, rather than it just being sort of knocked back by 50, 60 percent, that we find that the DNA degrades in our private sector economy. In other words, it might be too early to know, right? That might very well be the case. And I think it is too early to know. But if you look at some of the um, historic numbers comparing U.S. cities during the influenza pandemic in 1918, and 1919, it's quite interesting that just purely from an economic perspective, those cities that locked down very quickly and very drastically recovered much quicker than cities that were kind of wishy-washy about it. Um, so I think the data isn't out yet uh, for the current pandemic, but there is a good chance that either of us might be actually right. Okay, Chris, let me come back to you. And I want us to focus on uh, a little bit of what we think, but also what we think the people think. Uh, I mean, you're a long-term crusader for people's freedom to choose, you know, their right to smoke cigarettes if they want to, their right to drink beer and gamble and eat whatever food that they want to. You're not finding many allies here in the British public, are you? We're not so much sleepwalking into illiberalism as enthusiastically marching towards illiberalism. Seems that a large number of people don't even want the right to work anymore. I mean, how horrified are you by these sort of findings is it you know does it prove that those of us who've been fighting the good cause of personal freedom don't even have the oppressed on our side well i've often found that that is the case to be fair and it's been interesting to see uh, in recent days the, a big effort to try and uh, pin a beastie as uh, you know perhaps a major risk factor for covid 19 which it isn't um you know i i am prepared to believe that uh, the people will be on my side in a fairly short space of time. You know, I know the polls at the moment, the poll last week said 77% of people in Britain um, wanted to extend the lockdown. I think that could easily change by the end of this week, if not by the end of, of next week. You know, the people's patience will snap with it eventually. And as, clearly as the numbers go down, people presumably will be more open to the idea of, of, of getting back to work. But it is definitely a big problem um, when people are, essentially making a trade-off between cost and benefit when they're not really suffering the costs yet and the fact that they're insulated from from the economic damage um, is not very helpful for people coming to a, a rational decision about this nevertheless i mean to to be you know, slightly play devil's advocate i mean i think there are legitimate reasons for extending the lockdown they're just reasons that the government hasn't um admitted to yet uh, one of them is, is simply buying time um, in a way, it's quite nice to be behind some of the other countries because you can learn the lessons of what works. And, and, and uh, we're certainly seeing some of those lessons in, um, in Asia. Um, but also contact tracing, for example. We clearly haven't got the infrastructure for that. This app is being developed. I'm pretty pessimistic about whether it'll work very well. There seems to be lots of people who are simply going to refuse to download it because they think that vote leave are going to have possession of the data or crazy ideas like this um but contact tracing seems to be probably the most critical part of the jigsaw adam has mentioned the face mask they, they probably do have an effect travel bans i'm sure have an effect um but the, the contact tracing particularly in south korea has been really effective in stamping it out we don't seem ready to to get that in place by any means we only just started trying it i think today in the in the isle of white or a couple of days ago in the isle of white um, so maybe we actually do need to buy a bit of time. If we're going to have a travel ban, it would make sense to have the travel ban begin a week or two before we let people 
sort of go back to something approaching normality. So I think, in all honesty, you can justify another couple of weeks of lockdown to try and get those things in place so we don't have this second wave of infections. Look, nobody, least of all me, wants to go into lockdown again. It's very important that we avoid that, you know, a big second wave, because if, if it gets big, the only way to deal with it will be to do the same as we did at the end of March. Um, so I'm not totally opposed to relaxing the, the lockdown laws. Um, but again, I'd just like the government to, uh, to level with us. To use well, words, words Chris, let me, let me press you on that point. I mean, it, the, the bit that confuses me a little here is why we're so determined that if we come out of lockdown, we have to come out of it permanently. You say nobody wants to go into lockdown again, but I don't want to be in lockdown. I'd rather come out of lockdown and find in six or eight weeks time that we need to do another two weeks of lockdown. You know, I mean, now I'm uh, used to how to deal with it. I'd much prefer that than to say we can't ease the lockdown at all until we're certain we'll never need this policy tool again. I mean, you could almost have six weeks on, two weeks off, couldn't you? Well, it, would it be two weeks on? You know, uh, I mean, it was meant to be three weeks on this occasion it was gone to six weeks looks like it's going to go something close to nine weeks if not longer so I, I going into lockdown for two weeks isn't going to cut it it's just not going to do the job and we've seen what the British public are like when you put them in lockdown for a few weeks they want to stay in lockdown for quite a lot longer so I think a second lockdown would be really really problematic actually um, there probably would be quite a bit of resistance to it once people have been through it for a couple of months um, only you know, slightly earlier in the year. So I do think it's crucial to avoid that second lockdown and that second big peak. And the government is right that, you know, okay. the more you stamp it out this time and the more you get these procedures in place to, to keep it suppressed, then the less likely it is we'll need to do it again. Okay. Um, Adam, to, to go back to some of the, the, the standouts in the, in the findings in public opinion, um, Hong Kong, uh, uh, a different country to the UK, but assuming that we're, you know, that the populations are relatively similar in some ways, and they're a little bit ahead. Do you think that is a signal about where Britain and other countries will end up? Far more, uh, you might not go so far as say enthusiastic, but uh, turning their sights onto getting the economy and society back up and running again, rather than uh, as we presently see as a sort of spot price in Britain or opposition to that. Do you think this could turn on a sixpence that, you know, give it another two weeks and our figures will be like Hong Kong's? These will be the most variable, swingable opinion polls ever seen. And wow, that's saying something given what politics has been like in recent years. This might be the case, but I'm very skeptical about it, to be fair. I think Hong Kong is an outlier um, for many reasons, but one of them is its attitude towards social norms and institutional trusts. And I was quite surprised about some of the findings that Sam presented to us, because it looks like that one of the, well, the two countries that really seem to have lagged behind in the response, and as a result, they have one of the highest per capita death rates, uh, is one of them is the United Kingdom. But people seem to be fairly um, positive towards how the government has handled the pandemic, which I found quite surprising. And on the other hand, Hong Kong has a much, much lower um, per capita death rate, um, but, but the people there seem fairly critical about the communication of the government. Um, I think a lot of people would be more confident in relaxing the lockdown if they could um, ensure that social distancing um, will be respected and some of the social norms in the United Kingdom will change as a result of the pandemic. Um, people just don't trust one another in that regard. Um, I have had fairly positive experiences in the UK uh, when it comes to respecting the lockdown. Um, but um, I think that that's one of the reasons why the UK um, citizen, why UK citizens might be a bit more skeptical about the relaxation. Um, the other one is institutional trust. Um, there is a lot of trust in the NHS, um, which is not necessarily justified in my opinion. Um, so we really do have to look at kind of the best practices from all across the world when it comes to creating that um, tracing app. For example, Chris already mentioned that um, this app might not work as well as in some other countries because of the over-centralized nature of it. And I think that really describes a lot of problems how the UK have hand, has handled the pandemic 
the over centralized nature of the NHS really comes into place, not just throughout um, regular healthcare, but also when it comes to um, establishing that contact tracing app, which is much more decentralized and much more independent sure. of governments in Germany and Austria sure. compared to the UK government's plans. Um, Chris, let me come back to you. Uh, it, it seems to be a majority opinion or perhaps just a, a meme uh, that life will never be the same again uh, after this. Uh, is that really true? I mean, it seems to me that actually after these sort of things, generally historically things have reverted to normal. I'm not sure that Britain in 1948 was that different to Britain in 1938 and they'd been all out uh, world war in the interim. Do you think there are any permanent features that will change, Chris, or do you think it's just that uh, people sort of are assuming things will never be the same again just because for the past few weeks we've been in extraordinary circumstances? I think the latter. I don't see any reason why in a couple of years things won't be indistinguishable from the way they are now. I'm quite sure in the short to medium term there'll be less hugging and kissing of strangers and probably less shaking hands. That's not necessarily a bad thing in my opinion. Um, but I mean that, that will come back. I mean it's human, human nature I think to, to interact in the way we have done. Once this is history once there's a vaccine and when nobody's worried about it anymore i just don't think that there will be any real change there might be some prejudice towards china for a little while but i, I think ultimately uh, free trade will smooth that over um, there will be a certain psychological scar on the nation um, i think the main thing is that people will just keep talking about it all the time i don't think it actually change people's behavior but i think it will go down in in kind of folk memory as well, in the same way that the, the, the elderly people have war stories, we'll all have yeah. our coronavirus stories. Yeah. yeah, it'd be kind of like a lame version of the Blitz. Um, and people will <laughs> talk about it. People will also, I think, be nostalgic about elements of it, you know, as well. Um, I, I read something actually in The Guardian this week by uh, Richie Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, who wrote The Spirit Level. And they're already talking about how wonderful the uh, social capital is and people trust one another and people are helping each other out and all this kind of stuff. Um, they look back fondly uh, on the Second World War for the same reason, and even the, the mid 1970s of all of all periods. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I think that'd be a bit of uh, nostalgia, but I don't think it will change people's behaviour in any meaningful way. Okay, let me. I want to finish by asking each of you, uh, Adam. I'll start with you. Uh, another um, key insight that Sam shared with us was uh, quite a warning. Uh, shot really to people of a free market or classical liberal persuasion. Government's going to be broad, government's going to be deep, government's going to be everywhere, certainly for the short term and maybe for a lot longer than that. Um, Adam, talk us through what you think challenges are here for free market liberals, especially over the medium term. I mean, obviously, government intervention's colossal at the moment. But do you think that remains with us? lurking, lingering, or do you think it can be washed away as quickly as it arrived? What do groups like the IA and others need to do? I wish it could be washed away as quickly as it arrived, but I don't think it's very realistic. And that's why I think life is going to change significantly after the pandemic is over, not because of public health reasons necessarily, but because of the political and economic impact um, that our response actually created to it. Um, I'm quite fearful of biopolitics, um, of, of governments deciding um, to increase surveillance of their own citizens in the name of public health. I think that will be a, a very big discussion in the upcoming years. You know, when I'm boarding a flight, um, um, I need to go through security, I need to go through check-in. I might need to have my temperatures taken in the future. I might need to provide a pass that um, I passed the corona test or whatever other kinds of tests that are going to be out there. Um, and I think that's quite dangerous from, from the perspective of a free society. So we are going to have to emphasize a lot more the kind of individual civil liberties and not just necessarily the economic liberties. But on the economy, the impact won't be any less significant. I think our relationship to China will be incredibly different in the next decade than it was in the last decade. And that means rethinking some of the global supply chains, 
that are incredibly dependent on China. So I think regionalization is going to become more important. Um, and then the role of, you know, the European Union or other kind of uh, regional blocks for free trade sure. is going to increase probably at the expense of global free trade. Uh, Chris, you've recently written an IEA briefing paper on uh, the state, the appalling state, I guess, of liberties in Britain, thanks to the lockdown, and your fears that um, uh, we might not be able to sort of snap back as easily as we would hope to a free society. Uh, fears that you share with Friedrich Hayek, whose road to serfdom was about trying to get freedoms back after the Second World War have, uh, has ended. What do you think the challenges are for pro-freedom people coming out of this, even when the pandemic has dispersed, uh, which liberties do you fear might not return in short order or indeed at all? I'm not sure exactly which liberties might be taken away permanently, but I think there's a big danger that some of them will be. And the, the Coronavirus Act and the similar legislation to justify the lockdown um, is so enormous that even if only a tiny fraction of it is kept permanently, it would be one of the biggest blows to civil liberties for, for decades. Um, and you know, civil libertarians on the left and the right need to be very, very wary about this, really hold the government's feet to the fire, make sure that they repeal every, uh, every last word. Uh, of that legislation more broadly yeah there are huge problems in terms of you know how the economy is changing there'll be more demands for um you know basic income for example i think will be pushed nobody's in any mood for any kind of austerity which is to say paying any of this money back and so i fear with the public finances are going to be in a pretty uh, bad state there are you know there are all kinds of of risks and and threats it's it's there's not much to be optimistic about i'm afraid well, on that happy, upbeat <laughs> note, um, uh, thank you very much, Adam and Chris, for joining us. My thanks again in his absence to Sam Lyon for a fascinating uh, presentation. We'll see how quickly things change. Uh, plenty of challenges, perhaps a few rays of optimism. Maybe we're out of the worst, but uh, uh, an awful lot of work for the pro-freedom um, uh, groups to, to undertake. Quite a lot of challenges, even when... COVID-19 has disappeared. Thank you very much, Chris and Adam, for joining us uh, on this vidcast. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, please keep uh, up to date with all of the IEA's online material. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Uh, you can also find out about all of the IEA's ongoing activities by signing up to our free email newsletter, IEA Daily. In order to get that, just go to our website, iea.org.uk, and type in your email address there. It's free to sign up. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, good luck in getting your freedoms back, and look forward to speaking to you all again very, very soon. Bye for now.